everyone, it's uh, Dario here. Thanks for joining us. Um, just wanted to give you a little heads up about this bonus episode. Just a very quick introduction from myself. This was recorded just a couple of days ago. Um, again, in podcast time, that could be weeks ago for you, depending on when you're listening to this. But Neil very kindly agreed to join me in a remote Q&A for one of my lectures at Ravensbourne University. I'm teaching a course this term called Professional Life Practice and I wanted Neil to discuss his making of the film Wilderness in the context of the university structure and the fact that the film was crewed largely by students. I thought the tie-in was really interesting in terms of my students going out to do their first bit of what we call work-based learning in the second semester. So I thought it would be an interesting interesting way to kind of think about the ways in which students can pull out learning from professional experiences because I think sometimes we can take it for granted when we send students out to things like work experience and internships that the learning itself will be self-evident. But I don't think necessarily that's the case. And Neil was absolutely on top form for this talk, so we thought for the number of academics who were listening who work in film practice and work in screenwriting, this would be really an interesting talk for you guys, but also the many students who listen to the podcast as well. So so that's all I needed to say, really. There are some sound issues uh, on the episode. It's not too bad. It's just that we recorded it live live in a big lecture theatre, so the... the the acoustics weren't the best, but they're still good enough for you to enjoy it. So this is me talking to Neil about film practice and pedagogy. Well, thanks very much for doing this, uh, Neil. We're, we're trying to sort of manage the uh, technical ad hoc way of getting around recording and doing a lecture at, at the same time. Um, and just so everyone knows, we're going to put this out on a bonus episode of the, the Cinematologist podcast and maybe on YouTube as well. There will be time for Q&A at the end. You might have to come up here and ask Neil directly. That would be nice. But again, if you want to ask a question, you are going to be on the recording. Um, so, Neil, yeah, I mean, I asked you to do this primarily because of the, you know, the work that you did on Wilderness. And just to give you a little bit of context, we're in this middle of this module that's about professional development and students working out how they can forge a career start but starting within the context of university at, 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 in the second year you know so they're along quite away from graduating still but it's that sense of not not getting to the end of the course and being like okay shit what now you know what i mean um so we'll talk about a little bit about the film but also about your sort of general experience about working with students in in that professional environment but maybe you could just give us a quick intro and a, and a bio just so everybody knows who you are Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me today virtually. It's really nice to be talking to you. Um, so, yeah, my name is Neil Fox, uh, Professor of Film Practice and Pedagogy at Falmouth University, where I work with yeah. professional directors on film productions and, uh, yeah, sort of working, ha- working out how to work with students um, and, uh, and and graduates in those sort of professional environments. And then I do research out of that. But that's a long it's a long way from where I started. So I started as an independent filmmaker. Uh, I studied film at university in the late 90s, then set up a company in Luton, which is where I'm from, uh, making films and running film festivals. And the films that I was making were kind of always, because they were being made in Luton, kind of low budget, independent, uh, and often crewed by people who hadn't had any experience of working on film sets, including students from the local university. So by the time I got to university um sort of teaching in 2013 i was kind of well versed in making indie movies with um just a load of people who had no experience um so when i was asked what i wanted to do based on my doctorate which was in film education which i think we might talk about um uh when when i was asked by my my new boss what we should be doing i said we should be making we should be making feature films and we should be making short films you know within the department that utilize students um on them in kind of in key roles rather than just the kind of the old placement model um which had been around for quite a while um i'm a screenwriter and producer by background um i'm also a podcaster uh, as you might know 
Um, and uh, yeah, I write film criticism as well, particularly around music documentaries. And I've got a book coming out about music documentaries and concert films in the spring with the BFI. So I think that's probably a good potted history. Yo, oh, thanks for that. Um, so as you said there, your your PhD is in film education and obviously trying to get a feature made and we'll come on to wilderness itself is is a very difficult thing anyway but then to get it done within the 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 institutional barriers that the that universities are is a you know a massive undertaking so just to start off with what what do you think are some of the difficulties for teaching film practice in universities with the supposed aim of preparing students for industry i think the most difficult thing is trying to help students kind of shift their mindset when they arrive into what's actually possible teaching at universities um i think that understandably the majority of students who arrive doing a film degree have a have a thought that working in film means working at pinewood on the latest bond or the latest star wars or the latest you know um huge christopher nolan project which is a kind of rarefied air and it's it's kind of probably less than one percent of what filmmaking in terms of how it's actually done professionally um around the world actually takes place but that is a very kind of you know romantic and kind of very powerful notion that you're going to work on huge sets with huge amounts of staff and huge budgets um and there's going to be a huge amount of crew and it's going to take a long time um whereas the reality of what universities can actually provide an education in is is independent film you know we might have some of the same cameras that get used but the amount of resource is much much less than you'll find uh, on a on a kind of big big budget film um timing is different ex levels of experience are different we don't have access to all the same departments so what we're really teaching at universities is how to be an independent filmmaker now largely that is what most of the filmmakers that um the students who would come to university you know aspire to be that's how they started they started in that kind of environment of scrabbling around trying to make work trying to do the best they can trying to solve problems trying to be creative trying to just get something made against kind of great odds very, very quickly. Um, so I think we are teaching the skills that students will need at all levels of the industry, but what it looks like when you're at university in terms of the kind of filmmaking you're doing is always going to be much closer to um, independent film because universities just don't have the resource to match um, what you know sort of elite filmmaking actually looks like. And I think that one of the problems that universities have got themselves into over the last 20 probably 20 years is sort of marketing themselves as being able to do that because <laughs> it's just it's never going to be possible and it leaves courses with a very difficult task one of the great things about it which is also the challenge is is helping students kind of develop those skills and and understand that you know the scale of filmmaking might go up if you progress through the industry to that very 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 top but ultimately your day-to-day in terms of what you're being asked to do is very, very similar. The fundamentals are kind of the same. Cool. So beyond then turning up <laughs> to class and passing assessments, you know, which again, always has that, that air of being very schooly, you know what I mean? And it's really difficult then because you want the filmmaking process and to be enjoyable and to be cool and fun and all those kinds of things. But whenever you put learning outcomes and all that kind of stuff on, on the top of it, it, it's, it becomes kind of problematic. And, in, and, you know, we're always sort of trying to manage that, that, that sort of transition, as you say, and then on a module like this saying to students, look, it's up to you to kind of take responsibility for your own trajectory into the industry. And, you know, often that involves doing things that's beyond just what's in class. So what should students be doing from early on? while they're in the context of university and going through their journey with with regards to career shaping and, and that kind of thing? Uh, turning up's a good start, um, always. Um, again, it's a good discipline. I think, you know, you're going to be expected to turn up when you're, um, when you're you know, when you're in, in, the, in the professional world. Um, so kind of getting that discipline of turning up, even when you're tired or even when 
you don't want to do it um or you think it's a bit boring or whatever like it's a really good discipline for work that that is going to be kind of necessary um i think a lot of people come to university knowing what they want to do and that's really great um in terms of like what path they want to do they want to be an editor they want to be a sound designer they want to be a cinematographer and they just that's that's great a lot of people don't i don't think there's um a better approach to being you know in terms of but i think that in both in both instances one of the most important things is understanding that university is not going to get you, the university itself is not going to get you a job it's always going to be on you to to work out what you're going to do when you leave now universities can support that they can give you the skills they can they can provide introductions they can provide opportunities but it is always going to be down to you to develop the skills that that help you when you leave um in in, in you know so i think that if you know what you want to do then you know it is it is kind of on you to to make the most of that experience make the most of the opportunities um and the sooner you start doing that the better you know like i think it is common for people to think well i'll do that just before i leave but it, i always think it's important to think of it in terms of like having the momentum to uh to leave kind of with a with velocity rather than doing your degree and then almost having a standing start when you leave and thinking okay well what next because in this context of university those opportunities are places to learn places to kind of to work out how things work what the culture's like what is expected of you and being able to come back and talk to your staff or, or, or even your peers about your experiences and help them shape you in a kind of environment where there's less at stake than just being out there on your own and kind of at the mercy of of the industry the other thing i think is just take the time to work out if you don't know what you want to do what you want to do um i think universities are under appreciated as spaces for development of people's you know identity and and, and what they actually want to do you know there is a pressure that kind of society puts on young people and that universities kind of exert as well in in a lot of the ways they promote their courses as if it's like you must know when you arrive but one of the great things about university is a space to be curious and a space to to try things and experiment you know and i think i always think if you're leaving university knowing actually i'd like to spend more time working in production design um that's what i'm going to do next that's that's a really good degree as far as i'm concerned because you've you've been you know exposed to a lot of different opportunities you've been curious you've done this you've done that you've not had a really steadfast idea of who you are which i think when you're 18 is quite dangerous um and then you've taken that opportunity and committed to it and now you're in a better place for understanding what you're going to do when you leave i think that i teach screenwriting and one of the hardest things i teach in screenwriting is is kind of confidence in yourself you know i think that I can vaguely remember being 18 and I remember this kind of patina of confidence which masked not really having much confidence you know and a lot of the a lot of the challenges of university are basically talking to people about your work about what you want to do and kind of getting comfortable having conversations with people and I think we might talk more about that later on in terms of like what is what what filmmaking is in terms of being really valuable um and what you know what's meaningful and what life lessons sort of come out of it but, but ultimately you know you've just got to have conversations with people you've just got to talk to people you just got to get just got to get to know people you've got to learn you know the kinds of people you want to spend time with and most of those people that you're going to meet in the industry in terms of job roles are, are sitting around you um you know and you should be kind of developing a kind of core community of filmmakers that will be there when you leave and that kind of i've always benefited from collaboration in the sense of not just creatively but it's very difficult working in film so if you've got a team of people around you who you've known for a long time who you're very comfortable with who you can go into each project with it's really really valuable great so just moving on to wilderness then so this is one of the most impressive things i think that you you've done is to write and produce a feature, like I say, on its own, but then to have it crewed, you know, I, I don't know, you can tell me, it's 90 odd percent by students, but also then produced kind of as a commercial film. You know, so it doesn't have that badging of 
being a student film. So maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about the development of that, you know, how did you get it through the university as a starting point? Um, by kind of just using indie smarts, really. Um, you know, you sort of mentioned earlier about like, you know, making films within this kind of institutional space. Um, and I think that my experience of making work in Luton, sort of developing film festivals and I'd always been, you know, kind of aware of what I needed to do in order to get a project made and who I had to kind of convince to, to give me the money or the time to do it in a way that framed the project for, for their ends, you know, be that kind of funders or, you know, local councils or local, whoever it was I was trying to work with, I knew that there would, there would be a way of kind of communicating what it was that would make it easier for them to trust me and then kind of give them give them a sense that it was worth investing in. Now, that I never did that from a disingenuous place. You know, like, it wasn't like, oh, I just want money to go off and do my own thing. It, you know, I was always interested in, yeah, education particularly and, you know, working in a community. But I also wanted to make films, you know, and, and it, it's hard to make films and it's hard to make the kind of films where you're just you're just making the film you want to make, you know, and trying to trying to stay true to that when it's not always the most commercially viable opportunity, you know, sort of project. So, yeah, as I sort of said earlier, when I moved into university teaching, I still wanted to make films and I hadn't made a feature at that point. So on the in the back of my mind was how can I make a feature? So I just used the experience I'd had. And because I'd worked with a lot of students and recent graduates, you had no experience, but were absolutely brilliant on set. I kind of did go into both my doctorate and teaching in university with the mindset of like, students can be trusted to make work at a much higher level than they are. You know, there is a very kind of common perception of students that, you know, that they're just students and they don't know anything. And I think that's really kind of, you know, pernicious uh, throughout the industry. And I was always a bit stubborn in that sense. So I was like, well, I wonder if we could do this. So I kind of pitched it as thinking that it could work and knowing that even if we didn't make it like if we didn't succeed in making a feature in the time that we had with the budget we had it would still be a great experience for students you know and I would still learn whether it was possible or not to do it this way it was kind of the only option I had in terms of making a feature at the time so I kind of framed it entirely as a teaching exercise knowing that it would be and knowing that that's where the real value was always going to be and then if it if we made it, that would be great. If it was good, even better. <laughs> and then if it went further and further, all of that was a bonus really. So I was kind of, I was confident that we could make something. Um, but in that weird way, I did that kind of classic, classic indie film thing of being like, oh yeah, we can do this and we could do it. And we, this, we can do it in two weeks at Easter and we can do it for this amount of money. And then of course, the university said, okay. And I was like, okay. Um, yeah. And they were like, yeah, that sounds great. You know, we'll, we'll back this. And then, so I said to the the director who I've worked with for a long time, who'd worked in this way with me, you know, with, I said, okay, they've, they've said, yes, we can make it then. Um, and they're going to give us some money. Um, but I, we didn't have a script. We didn't have a project at that point because I think in the back of my mind, I was always like, they're never going to go for this. Um, but they did. So then that was sort of September 2015. And we'd agreed that we were going to shoot in April 2016 in two weeks over spring break. Um, so then I literally had to develop a um, uh, a project from scratch, write it, and then get into pre-production. So I kind of wrote the, the, wrote the script between September and December. Um, and then from January, we were in pre-production. Um, and the students kind of we 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 launched it to the students in the September and said we're going to make this in April, and that started that. And then yeah, we just sort of put the creative team together, which was very very small. As you said, there was only the editor was a professional, the director was a professional, the DP that we planned was a professional, um, and we had a professional sound recordist who was on staff. Um, but other than and myself, but other than that, everything was going to be student based, apart from the actors who were obviously hired professionals. Um, yeah, and then we ended up shooting in April, 
and we got it done in yeah we shot over 11 days in cornwall and we did one day of pickups in in luton um at a jazz club um but that was it yeah it was done so when when you did pitch it to the students then obviously you're not going to be able to because your course is a big course like this one not everybody's going to get on so how did you sort of deal with that kind of situation with the interviews that 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 the students had to go through and was it from the start was what they did on on set then part of their assessment you know is that how you sort of uh, structured it for the students um yeah weird that my fear was that loads of students wouldn't get on what what ended up happening was that hardly anybody applied um so everybody who did apply got on um and Why, you know like, what, what i mean do you have any sort of reasoning for that if i'm being kind it's because it hadn't been done before you know but we've been doing that version of things now for almost 10 years and still very very few students apply to be on these kinds of productions and i find that really interesting and i think that it does go back to what i was saying before in terms of there's a confidence thing there's a sense of like oh, i won't get on it's not for me um i don't have enough experience um whereas the reality is that's that, that's fine no one does you know we're asking everybody who's kind of at the same level and it's not about having experience it's about committing to something and then getting the experience through it um but we kind of built built the the process so that it was assuming that more people would and we still do it the same way which is that students apply through the production so although i was a producer on it i had nothing to do with the students kind of getting on it um because obviously most of them were sort of in their first and second year um and i then have to teach them when they came back so you know or if they didn't get on so it's kind of like just and to make it make it more of a professional experience so they would apply to the production you know a kind of cv um which is more of an exercise obviously they didn't have any experience but it was more just going you know going through the common industry process of kind of cover letter and a cv and then uh justin the director and steven who was the editor and the post-production supervisor they did the interviews for the students and then they just checked with me as a member of the course team that those students were in good academic standing um and that what we what we decided that was if you had to be attending, you know, like you couldn't just be applying to be on this kind of thing, but not not turning up in class. Mainly because that shows that if you're in class, that you, there's a kind of level of trust in terms of actually committing to it um, and being and being part of the part of the the whole community process of it. And the other thing was you couldn't have work outstanding at the time of the production, so it was done in spring break, um, but. Uh, if you had like outstanding work from the first term that needed to be in just you know either just before or just after spring break I can't remember then you, you couldn't you couldn't do it because because it wasn't assessed so it couldn't impact your studies okay. um which you know because it can't be to the detriment of your degree which is kind of why you're there um so it wasn't assessed um it's really hard to do it assessed um film wise is is i w i always find kind of live briefs and live placement work much much harder in film than other kind of screen industries like tv or something or even advertising because they're, they're not there's no schedule for this stuff it doesn't happen on a schedule there's no broadcast date there's no kind of streaming calendar there's no you know there's no kind of sort of deadline for for airing in terms of a, a campaign if it's an advert or something like that so you're kind of waiting for money, you're waiting for opportunity, you're waiting for all these kind of things to align if you're trying to make a film. So trying to align that with 12 weeks of assessment, I just thought was always, and 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 doing that thing which you said, which trying to make it available for enough students. Um, you know, we couldn't have done it assessed because it would have meant trying to get 120 students through it, um, for example, if it was a core module. So, but it wasn't. Um, and, and again, the aim was try and put first and second years on it so they could come back into the course with that experience and then see what would happen to the course with those students who'd been in that professional environment um that was one of the key things we wanted to sort of learn um and sort of track in terms of the student's experience um i think that that's all does that answer it yeah 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 yeah, yeah for sure
Other people don't matter to me anymore. I feel the same. Also love each other and not be together because it's just a mess. I'm not sure if we're just gonna make a mess. This is perfect, isn't it? It's all I've ever wanted. Um, you mentioned earlier on that phrase mindset, and I think that that's you know it's obviously a key thing going through university, the mindset of a student to a mindset of a professional and sort of developing that as you go through. But then, you know, when you've got a specific project like, like that, it's got to be enacted very quickly. Otherwise, you know, things can go wrong. And I just wondered, you know, what stories can you tell about um, problems that maybe came up? Um, did any students kind of not get that, that, you know, actually this is a professional set. This is not just a lark kind of thing. Ah, uh, yes. Uh you know, you know this, so uh, we've talked about this. Um, yeah, there was the, we learned a lot from it, you know, in terms of what what students would bring to it in terms of yeah their their mindset and their expectation and how they saw it. We were very lucky that the majority of the students, I think there was about twenty three to twenty five students who were on set, um, and then there was extra students in post production. Um, but I think about 25 students were on set at various times over the course of the, the 11 days. And out of all of those students, two of them just didn't get it. You know, um, one of them didn't get it in a way that was just kind of not, not a particularly negative experience for anyone in terms of, you know, it just, they just didn't, they just didn't, they couldn't get to grips with the, the culture and the hierarchies. And I say hierarchies, not in a terms of a power concept, but in a terms of there are hierarchies on a film set that in order for the thing to work often need to be maintained you know so you know second ad you know third ad to a second ad to a first ad is a hierarchy it doesn't mean that the first ad is quote unquote more powerful or should be bullying or dominant or anything but it means that they have a level of responsibility which everything needs to feed into in order for things to operate because you know everything is time and everything is money and everything needs to you know that everything it's just a really really kind of high pressure situation on a film set so when you talk, who you talk to, how you talk is is really really important for a very you know because if it's if if everything gets derailed, even for like 10, 15 minutes, it can really it can really mess up your day. So, and that obviously brings with it a certain pressure in terms of how people talk to each other and how people communicate to each other, and often that's not the best. But for the most for the most part, it's just we need to get this done, and you can create an environment where around that period of of kind of being on set and actively shooting. People feel like welcomed and, you know, trusted, respected. And then it's kind of like, okay, we're not going to be cruel and mean, but we're going to be like, okay, just do this now. We need to do this now. Please do this now. And one student just could not grasp that their role was functional and needed. We just needed them to do certain things. And they kept speaking out of turn and they kept like speaking to the wrong people, speaking at the wrong times. It was, it was a lot, you know, but because the teaching was built in, that was fine. You know, like it was fine to just be like, again, you wouldn't say this on a, you know, if you were out there or not on this kind of project, you know, this would be a problem. And and we did that for a lot of students and a lot of them got it very, very quickly. Like, okay, yeah, cool. You know, and one student just didn't get it. There was another case where it was slightly different and this student was, yeah, kind of actively not engaged in the process when they weren't doing the job that they were doing and they were kind of they were in the they were in the sound department so they were just taking themselves off to work on their own stuff you know which was really weird so i would come on set as a producer and the screenwriter 
and that a scene would be being prepped and the student would have a, their own script out and be kind of making notes for their assessment and stuff. And it's always sort of two or three times. I was like, you know, I just, it really annoyed me. Um, cause it was like, it's just, it was just so disrespectful. So, and I said like, you know, um, what, what are you doing? And they are working on my script. And I was like, you know, should you be, should you be working on your, on your script when you're working on someone else's film? Um, you know, and you're in a, in the sound department and, you know, would you do that on a, um, you know, why are you doing that? And, and, and they turned around and they said, oh, I would never do this on a professional. And I was just like, what do you think this is? And they're like, oh, this is a student project. And I was like, is it? You know, like, what about, you're going to tell the actors, you know, <laughs> that this is a student film? Um, and it obviously it wasn't a student film, but it was just, I was absolutely kind of shocked. They were, and I said, well, maybe it doesn't look great to be, you know, working on, um, on your own kind of personal project when, you know, we're trying to shoot something else. Um, and it didn't, didn't, didn't phase that student. That student was like, well, you know, uh, thanks for that, but just going to keep going. And I was like, I couldn't do anything about it, you know, because, and the reason I couldn't do anything about it was because I hadn't, um, I hadn't put in place the, the structure of what to do if that happens. I just never imagined that that would happen. You know, I would have, I just thought that, even if I thought the students would be on their phones, you know, sort of bored or whatever in between stuff. And that didn't really happen because most students were kind of like, this is great. Um, and because we shot over 11 days, it was very little downtime. Um, and a lot of that downtime was kind of talking to them about what was going on and, and sort of, you know, sort of doing teaching alongside the making of it. Um, but for this student to just be completely disrespectful was really interesting and made me think, oh, actually, we need to build in the opportunity to fire people, <laughs> you know. Um, because if that had happened on a, if you, know, if you were on a professional set and I know it was a professional set, but what I mean is a professional set outside of the context of the university that, we, you know, this very, very unique way of doing things that we were doing. If you did that to any degree, you would not be back. Like you just, there would be absolutely, you know, it's completely disrespectful. It shows that you're not engaged with what you're doing. It shows you don't really care about the project. And you know, a lot of people don't care necessarily to the depths of their soul about the script that they're working on but but there should there's an assumed level that everyone's working on the same thing pulling in the same direction committed to the same task and to visibly see someone absolutely not engaged with it was it, yeah it that was that was it was just really upsetting um but and i think why i would like to fire that student was was for teaching only you know i mean yeah i was annoyed but i was like the only way that you're going to learn really is to be told you know what don't come back. We don't want you back. You know, that would have happened several times across the course of the shoot in terms of things that students actually did. But a lot of the time, it was just a conversation. And I would say, like, if you did that, you know, in a, in a different context, then, you the you know, you would be told at the end of the day, you're not coming back um, for a variety of reasons. And it wouldn't always, it wouldn't necessarily be malicious. It would just be like, that's too disruptive. We can't have it. We don't have enough time to deal with this. We need to we need to sort of cap, you know nip this in the bud, um, and most of those students were like, okay, I'm really sorry, and but this student was just like, no, nah. and that was that was a shame, but it was also a valuable thing in terms of we we have to have stakes in these things, I think, otherwise the the te the learning that students get is not it's not not where it needs to be. Mm. Yeah, it's always a difficult thing, and especially like student groups is the is the really hard, isn't it? You know, internally because you can't fire people. No, then that, that then that jeopardy kind of is not with it not being there that can affect the production for sure. Um, so we have a work based learning module coming up in the second semester, and the projects on that. I mean, not to the scale that you've done there, but these are assessed, and the assessment is around you know what do you garner out of the professional environment in terms of your learning, and that could be technical skills, but it, it could also be you know a, a wider sense of life lessons or you know, notions of how to behave in certain situations and attitudes, some of the things you've, you've talked about there. Um, so I, w I wondered, you know, coming off of the project then, what feedback you got from some of the students in terms of that, that learning, and then where some of these students kind of found themselves career-wise on the back of this maybe? Yeah. Um, the learning was, was amazing really. And it was, it was in so many different ways. So about a year later, I kind of got the students together 
and interviewed them about the, what they remembered of their experience on the film, but also how it had impacted their studies. So they went, you know, they went off and then when they came back, what was interesting was that so much of the production culture changed in the school because we had a lot of students who came back and were producing or directing and they'd seen it work in a kind of live setting and just, um, yeah, it changed how they, how they managed their production meetings. They changed how they managed their sets. They changed how they talked to people and just the culture kind of shifted overnight, really, um, in a really, really kind of significant way on the course because those students came back and they taught each other, you know, like there was a lot of peer learning that, that happened where they were just able to, they felt more confident that they'd seen how to do it. Um, and sort of, you know, pass that on to, to their, their crews on the course, which was, which was really great. Um, a number of the students that worked on it kind of paid a lot of attention to the person they were working with, be that, um, actors, you know, if they were kind of just assisting, um, you know, and kind of working with the actors, um, the best one was the, you know, the edit assistant was so good working with, um, Steve and the editor, cause he did all of the sort of the DIT and the syncing on set, um, with the students. And, and one of them was just, she was just great, you know? So he was like, you know, just stayed in touch and he got that, he got her a work, he got her a placement, um, in the summer, uh, post house, um, and sort of mentored her. Um, and she, she works as an editor in the industry now. And, and we brought her back as a graduate to work on another short. So she came back to edit a graduate short, a short that we'd made, um, in house in in a similar way. Um, and we asked her to edit that just a couple of years after she left and she, she'd already learned so much from wilderness and then working in industry. And then she took her edit assistant on that and got them a placement where she was working and he's working in industry now as well. So that network, that kind of pipeline was, 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 was amazing really. Um, in terms of, yeah, the, the opportunity it provided students to, to see the kind of jobs that they wanted to do, to know which areas of film they wanted to work in and then being able to kind of make connections with professionals and there weren't that many, um, or to just, like, like I said at the start, just know, oh, actually, this is what I want to do. I want to work in production design. So how do I do that? And then those conversations we had in their third year, you know, were all around, how can I, how can I do this? You know, there was a, there was a real kind of focus to it, um, which wasn't there before. And, and then that was really valuable. Great. So I'm going to ask a couple of final questions and then I'm going to offer it out to the students to see if there are any questions that they, they might have. But just turning to the screenwriting, because there are screenwriters in the room um, today. So obviously with, with writing scripts, at, at university, sort of all bets are off. You can kind of do what you want. But we, we, we sort of, you know, the, I think screenwriting teaching talks a lot about writing for an audience and, and that kind of thing. So how do you feel about that sort of conflict between write for, in your, for yourself as a screenwriter, writing a story that you want to write and then thinking, ah, is this going to sell? Is this going to be interesting for a wider audience? How do you sort of balance that in your mind? I mean, that's, I saw this question before. It's a really tricky one. Um, because I think if you write with an audience in mind, then it's, it's I think it's quite dangerous to, to write with an actual audience in mind. Um, and what I mean by that is kind of imagining who's going to watch it and what they're going to think about it. I think can it just I think it leads to second guessing, and it leads to you kind of making a lot of concessions, even subconsciously, before before you really you know before you the project's even got off the ground. I think that you know a lot of a lot of screenwriters and sort of writer directors talk about. Well, I just I just write for myself, you know, and I think that that's kind of true in the sense of you as a writer have to have that really kind of deep connection to what you're doing you have to believe in it you have to have faith in it you have to you have to think it's a value and 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 largely when you're writing the only the only barometer you've got of that is yourself so i think it's really important to to feel that way but you know that question of like who's who's going to watch this i think is an important one i think that over the, I think there there are definitely films I made early on where I was like, I, I was not critical enough about that, and I took a kind of far too stubborn approach to like, well, this is obviously a value, 
and you know without realizing that the audience for a 1960s silent crime film inspired by Jean-Pierre Melville is not that big you know like just because it looks nice it doesn't mean it's going to have to you know like and the one thing I've realized is that as I've made more films is that you know the references I'm drawing on the kind of cinema I'm in conversation with the kind of films I want to make are not mainstream they're not mainstream films so you know when I send a film to a festival I have to you know, I have to hope that someone there knows who Ed Wood is or knows who Jean-Pierre Melville is or knows who Jean Cassavetes is. And the reality is at indie festivals all over the world, at, you know, at distributors all over the world, they don't know who these filmmakers are, <laughs> you know? Like, so my audience is is niche and it's cinephile and it's people who are engaged with, yeah, with with cinema that's quite specific, you know? And there was a period where I did get really upset and angry internally of like, why, you know, why are more people not watching this? But the reality is that not many people watch that stuff. You know, I love it. And I know that, and what's, what's been interesting is when, when it's got to festivals where there are people whose cinephilia kind of crosses over with mine, there's been such enthusiasm for my work that it's been really rewarding. It's just never going to be hugely successful because I'm not, the kind of films I make are not like that. They are they 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 are for smaller specialist audiences, um, and I'm okay with that now. You know, um, when I was younger, it was more difficult, but it never stopped me making the work. I just had to be critical and reflective and be like, okay, well, what kind of filmmaker am I? What kind of stories do I want to tell? And yeah, like it would be embarrassing to show my work to a huge audience because ninety percent of them would not get any of the references to it. And they'd just be like, this is terrible. And I'd be like, mm, you know, so whether it's good or not, it's harder in that space, you know, and I have to be the judge of that. And I can see, look back, looking back at my work, I'm like, I can see that this is not, not a good version of even what I'm trying to do. You know, like it's not a great, it's, I had an idea for a particular type of style or a particular homage, but I can look back and go, even in that context for that small audience, it doesn't work. Um, but learning from it you know, and, and kind of trying different things and, and sort of coming back now and having made a feature and, and a couple more shorts since it's like, mm. okay, I'm, I'm still working out who, who, who I want my audience to be and, and who they really are. Yeah. There's the, the, that sort of idea of a criteria for success, I think is something that everybody kind of reckons with, don't they? Throughout their careers. What is, what does success actually, yeah. actually mean? Um, yeah. So just finally, you know, what, what's your attitude towards, writing and getting critical feedback and not just writing maybe on the film itself you know how do you take and use feedback um on even rejection if you don't get a project or you don't get funding for example you know without getting apathetic angry disheartened depressed all of those kind of things how you know what's resilience for you that that word that is thrown about like confetti everywhere i hate that word um resilience um just because of all the horrible neoliberal connotations, you know, the, the whole world sucks and you need to, you need to kind of be resilient to it. It's your fault if you're not. I find that deeply, deeply problematic. Um, I, do, I do get angry, you know, and I do get disheartened and I think that's fine. I think it's, I think it's important to get angry and I think it's important to get disheartened. I think it's important to invest a level of care and feeling and emotion in your work that's, that's serious, you know, and I think that when you get feedback you can be angry about it, um, I think, but it has to be a process, you know. I think that what I've realized is that when I've been angry at feedback, and it took me a long, long time to realize this, is that I'm not angry at the person who's given me feedback. I'm not angry at that per. I'm angry at myself, you know. I'm angry at myself because I've sent work out, and deep down, I knew it wasn't, I knew it didn't work, I knew it wasn't good enough, I knew it wasn't ready. And for whatever reason, I put it out and been like, okay, here we go. And then someone said, you know what, Neil, that doesn't work or I'm not sure about this. And I've taken that really personally. And I've been like, you don't know what you're talking about. How dare you? I'm a genius. You know, um, all that kind of nonsense. But but that's just, that's defensiveness at, at, at masking something, which is actually, you know what? You know, it doesn't work and it's not ready and it's not great. And it doesn't, you know, 
that's a long process. But I think that dismissing people as if they don't have um, anything to say or anything to add is, is really, really dangerous. Uh, and thinking that you know best, you know, a um, couple of quick, th quick, like Mark Jenkins is very, very open with his process, you know, and I work with him quite a lot and he always shares his work in advance, you know, scripts and stuff a lot of the times where, you know, up until recently. Um, but I look at his work and go, I don't know what to say because he writes in such a specific way. And I know that what is the script is going to become something very different in the film. So he's looking for, he's looking for something he doesn't really know. You know, he doesn't, he's not looking for someone to tell him if it's good or not. He's not looking for someone to say, you know, he's just looking, is, is there something that's, that he's missed, you know, that's for kind of glaring and, and often there isn't. Um, but that openness is really, really important and, and, and finding people that you trust to, to spot stuff. I, when I, when I'm teaching, I'm always like, you need to share your work. And then they share it around a classroom and everyone goes, it's really great. You're doing really great. I really like this. Like, it's not helpful. Absolutely not helpful to just be really lovely and say, this is great. You know, no, it's not about being mean, but it's about just being honest and saying, and trying to make the work better. The only way you can make the work better is having a really good conversation about it. So you have to get to the point where you're comfortable saying to someone else, I don't think this works or I'm confused or, you know, why did you do that? You know, um, and a lot of that fear comes from the fact that you don't want someone to say that to you. <laughs> so you don't say it to anyone else. And then that just creates this kind of circle of, you know, platitudes which, where the work just stays where it is. Um, and there was a great, a, a script editor friend of mine has this great saying, I don't think it's necessarily his, but I, I got it from him, which is if someone tells you there's something wrong with your script, they're probably right. And if someone tells you how to fix it, they're probably wrong. Um, and I love the idea that if you if you read something and it doesn't work and you say it doesn't work it probably doesn't work you know and it might not be bad it just might be that it's not communicating what the writer wants to do your your idea of how you're going to fix that is entirely up, is entirely on you and your subjectivity and your taste and your experience and how you approach a story so you might not be able to fix that problem the writer can fix the problem but if the writer is open to understanding okay this person has said it doesn't work i'm going to go back in and i'm going to see what they mean and it could mean anything and you're the best person to do that but if you're not open to that possibility that your first draft or you which you're still calling draft 25 but it's essentially still your first draft because no one's seen it um if it if you if you're open to, if you're not open to the fact that it's not where it needs to be if you're not open to that then that's it's just it's it's never going to get any better you know um so look around the people in the room and build a network of people that you trust and not just screenwriters but you know, directors, producers, cinematographers, like get people to look at it and get as many eyes on it as, as possible and then start to develop your own your own critical response and never reply straight away to any feedback. You know, if you get notes, give it like five days before you respond. Um, even you just say, thanks very much. I'll look at these later. Even if you read it and you hate it and you punched a hole in the wall, just say, thanks, I'll look at this later. Um, and then four or five days later, maybe get a response but you have to go through that emotion because you see it personally you see it as your investment you see but ultimately where you'll probably get to is the fact that yeah they're right and i know that and the reason i'm upset is because i know it's not good enough or i know it's not ready um and there's so much emotional investment in it you just have to kind of wade through all of that to to see that see it in the clear light of day of like okay well how do how do i move on from here um all the great writers have a process that involves that in some way um even if it's working with an editor script editor or a, a novelist working with an editor or a poet you know like everyone goes through a process of dialogue about their work screenwriter is not solitary in the way that people always think it is yeah you and i have had these critical conversations over the years many times which is always interesting um okay anybody want to uh ask a question come on up Thanks, Tom, for uh, being the first. If anybody else has a question, if you want to come to the front and uh, might save some time. Um, hi, Neil. Um, sometimes some criticism I get is like I put too much of my life into my own work to sort of a slightly detrimental effect. And I'm interested as a writer, not that I will probably stop doing this, but how do you keep your writing personal without kind of ruining your interpersonal relationships with your friends? The audience is laughing, by the way. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> 
yeah hard 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 question really um drama not diary i think is is, is a key phrase I, I i kind of use for myself it's like no one's interested in the specifics of my life you know like they don't they don't care that i personally have been dumped or had a bad experience like they're not interested in that they're not interested in me they're interested in the story and they're interested in engaging it you know and if you can translate your experience into something which other people can tap into that that's where the real that's where the real good is you know um and that's hard to do because there is a a lot of reason why we write is to to get it out to get these feelings out and get them on the page and i think that it's a case of working through and past the very very direct experience that we've had and trying to you know sort of work out how others who haven't had that very very specific experience but have had a a similar experience can kind of can can tap into that um you really don't want your friends to see themselves directly on the um on the screen um or your family you know like and i did it i did it once actually and i i thought at the time i was doing the right thing and i spoke to a friend about it and said like i'd like to take this experience and put it in and it's in wilderness actually um and i wish i hadn't done that um i'm still friends with that person but i think it shifted the friendship um and i, I wish i hadn't done that i wish i'd have and again, I didn't have a lot of time and I should have done something else, but I just, there was something about what happened to this person that I really wanted to kind of explore, but I didn't do enough to make it obvious that I was exploring it. I was just kind of repeating it and that, that didn't feel great. Um, and also, yeah, like just the specific is universal, but what specific is, is key. So having having a kind of sense of detail and a sense of texture that comes from your experience is really important, but the actual diaristic events, you have to work out how to kind of push them away and bring back in what was meaningful emotionally about that. Um, and changing as much as you can in terms of the, 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 the specifics of the, the sort of the, the gender, the age, the race, or the, you know, the actual physical context of something is, is really really important but you know i think at, at, at where you are you can't really think your way out of that at this stage you just have to write your way out of it and you just have to work through and hopefully you know just be honest and genuine with people and um and empathetic as well you know don't exploit people but often people will be just uncomfortable if they can see that you're you're trying to do something for the right reasons and it is for for you then you know that they, they should forgive you in time that's a good one it's a really good question though it's a really good which i'm sort of worried about a little bit but and um, anybody else want to ask a question uh yep come on jenica hi so um, in regards to what you said how can you do that with car without like kind of losing the essence say that again uh how can you do that without losing the essence I think this is, is kind of, it's applicable to all screenwriting really, is what is it really about? You know, it's not, it's never, it's never what it's about. So, you know, if you have an incident where you're, um, you know, for example, mugged, you know, um, if you then put that mugging on screen and try and recreate it in, in detail, it's always going to be, it's always going to miss the point you know it's never going to be able to do that faithfully but what's important about that is 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 how you felt how did it make you feel scared vulnerable ashamed like all the feelings there you know that's what it's about you know so the mugging is an emotional act it's as well as a kind of practical act if you're trying to kind of recreate it as if it's like a crime reconstruction then you're you're kind of you're ultimately focusing on all the stuff that's external, all the stuff that's, you know, exterior detail rather than the emotion. That emotion can be translated into another thing, which isn't a mugging, which doesn't happen to you or your kind of screen alter ego, but where the feeling that you felt when it happened to you can happen in this character and the audience 
can, because it's been moved away from your very, very specific context, can be, exper can be experienced by an audience. One of the things about screenwriting, which I think is really important, is that when you're making a film, so much of what you've written on the page can change and often does change. And most of the time, it's for reasons that are not to do with someone who doesn't really care about your script. Most of the time it's to do, particularly when you're working independently with time, budget, cast, um, you know, just the things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis where we have to change this thing. We can't shoot this in two scenes. We need to do it in one. You know, we can no longer have this location, so you have to change that. You know, we can't get this person to do it. So, you know, who can we get to do it? Like all that stuff constantly changes what you've written. And as a writer, you need to be okay with that. And you need to be fine to say, yeah, let's work on this, let's work on this. And I think the way that you get fine with it is by having a really, really clear idea of, okay, what is my story about? What, when does this change into something that it's, that I'm not comfortable with? And if you, if it's about feeling and it's about emotion and it's about experience for an audience, then you can kind of do anything, you know, <laughs> like you can, you can go with any kind of change that you need to in terms of a production, as long as in, in, inside you go, actually, if you do this change, it suddenly becomes a different story. It suddenly becomes about uh, regret. And I don't want it to be about regret. I want it to be about, the story is not about regret. The story is about this. So the more that you are really kind of connected to what the story is about emotionally, the easier it is to A, write things which are not directly connected to your personal experience and also allow you to roll with the punches of indie filmmaking or even kind of high level filmmaking where, you know, so much is out of your control. But what's in your control is what is this about? What is this feeling that I've had that I want to translate to an audience? You know, so those kinds of post-it notes or whatever that those little kind of symbols to you that help you stick to that, those are the things that really, really count. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, James. Thanks. Well, um, so one thing I personally struggle with is uh, imposter syndrome. I don't put myself out there for a lot of projects generally because of that. Have you found working with students that any of them struggle with imposter syndrome and how do you personally help them overcome that to sort of crack on with the project? Um, good question. Very good question. Very good question. Um, yeah, not just students, staff, um, myself included. Um, I think imposter syndrome, is, yeah, we all have it, you know, and, um, and, and a lot of us still do. It, you know, what changes is, is, is how you deal with it. I think that one of the things I'm really interested in, in terms of my day-to-day -day work, the, in terms of working in a university now, but, but this kind of stretches back is who gets to, who gets to do this stuff, you know? And I think that even those really, really confident students who you sit next to, who you think they've got it all figured out. They've got so much experience. They know exactly what they're doing. They're, they're, you know, if they're honest with themselves, they have similar feelings to you. And a lot of it is, you know, the fake it till you make it necessity of life. You know, you just have to find somewhere the confidence to make that step into that space. I see my role, and I always have done in terms of being a producer, of bringing people into that space who don't think it's for them. Because I don't think it's for me. <laughs> you know, I look around in terms of my background and I don't see any I don't see many people like me who grew up in a place like Luton with no film you know no film education no film culture no access to that kind of experience growing up you know I made it with a friend who like I said earlier kind of supported me when I was down and 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 and, and I did the same this kind of little team of like well if we we just want to we want to do this and I don't see why we can't do it um and now it's about making sure that if you're a student who is sitting there just thinking, oh, I'd really like to do this, but I don't think it's for me. It's, it's saying, no, it is for you because <laughs> it's for everyone. You know, no one has the, no one has the, 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 the exclusive right to be a filmmaker or to work on a film set based on anything, you know, like, do you want to do it? Yes. Are you prepared to work hard? Yes. Then come on, we'll do it. Um, a lot of it is just, trying to pay attention you know looking out 
when I do a talk, can't see you all now, um, but I'm assuming that, you know, there's people there and just looking at and just paying attention to people. How are they sitting? You know, do they look like someone who really wants to do this, but is, just doesn't have the confidence? And it's about going up and saying, you know what? You should do this. You know, you can do this because everybody around is going to have the same level of experience and we're going to help you learn. That's the point of doing it. And I did that before I was in university and it's always been the same. Um, one thing also I've learned, which I think is really important, is that the majority of people you meet in film are well-meaning, decent people. There are some horrible idiots and they make it harder for everyone else. But most people want to do good work. Most people want to have meaningful experiences. Most people want to help those coming through and give back and support, you know, and it more often than not, just asking a question of someone will respond, will, will respond with a good answer. You know, it is really hard, but the only difference between you and anyone else around you is that they're just going to, they're going to somehow find the confidence to make that first step. That's the only difference. Um, you have as much to offer as anyone in your own way. Um, and the quicker you can make that really nerve wracking step and say, okay, can I do this? Um, the quicker you're going to find out what that is and find your people to do it. Right. Maybe one final question. Yeah. Come on up. I know. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I like live in London, also being a student in London. Um, I was just wanting to ask being kind of a, person from Bedfordshire from being a lecturer as well um, because of how where I come from I feel it's kind of a bubble it doesn't truly represent what our country kind of so, the social attitudes and the cultural differences what would you say were the kind of like key differences would you say or like the sort of differences would you think or truly represent what our country kind of shows in filmmaking and also just socially in itself um, do you mean like yeah could you say that again sorry because I'm not sure I think that's a really, I'm not sure what I'm, you know, don't, yeah, I don't want to misunderstand. So I just, I just said, I, I personally feel living in London and being a student filmmaker in this city has its limitations and restrictions due to it being such a vast metropolitan bubble and not actually fully representing uh, like the actual societal attitudes in this uh, country. Um, and like my question is, what were the, what were the cultural and social differences being a filmmaker and lecturer in kind of Bedfordshire, which is kind of more kind of like rural sort of, Britain, even though it was Luton in itself, but still, yeah. Oh, um, the cultural difference between Luton and London. Um, how long have we got, Dario? Um, <laughs> I spend my life defending Luton, and I, I spend my life defending Luton from people who live in London or a place where they take they take culture for granted. You know. I've been, you know, I've had the place I've defended Luton the most are where I am now, Manchester. Uh, actually, not Manchester, that's unfair. I've never had a problem in Manchester. But like Birmingham, Sheffield, Glasgow, Newcastle, anywhere I go in a big city, you know, where they're like Luton. And it's like, well, you've never been. You might have been to the airport or you've heard the, the news stories, but you've never been. You don't know what, you don't know what Luton's really like. And I think that you could say that for most places in this country because screen representations of Britain are criminally narrow, London-centric, or if they are regional, they're rural and they're from 300 years ago. You know, it's like period dramas or whatever. Like, we don't know what it's like to live outside London in this country in any real sense. There's no post-Brexit social cinema in any real sense, apart from Ken Loach and his movies are important but terrible. Um, so what... What do we know of what it's like to live in these places? You know, the, there is no regional cinema, but also I would argue, what do we really know how it, what it's like to live in London? What do, what's it like to be a student in London at the moment with, you know, the cost of living crisis, um, the oligarchy, like what's it like to, we don't know because we don't see these films. We, we have a very narrow conception of cinema from, from people who actually live in Britain and that hasn't changed in a long time. And, and we have these kind of small examples, which kind of just all the examples of the kind of social realism or even, you know, non kind of heritage cinema is cinema that's punched its way through, you know, filmmakers who've just absolutely stuck to an idea and said, 
you know, here it is. And, and, but what we do is we take that one film, you know, and I, I was, I was thinking of this in terms of like Newcastle, like we've got Get Carter and Stormy Monday. That's it. Two films or Billy Elliot, three, three films from a city the size of Newcastle in what, you know, 45, 50 years. It's absolutely insane. Um, and, you know, there are very, you know, there are some places where there's no films um, to represent, you know, where's the great film about Leicester? I'm sure there's got to be one. Leicester's an interesting place because everywhere is an interesting place. You know, I think if you're a student who's not from London, then, you know, going back home and making a film about your, you know, like would be a, a great idea, an important idea. But also if you're in London, don't think of London as, I mean, you, I don't know where you're from in London, but I doubt you would, you would ever say that London is one monolithic thing, despite it's kind of the power it exerts. You know, I think if you grow up in Hammersmith, it's very different to growing up in Walthamstow um, or you grew up in Chelsea it's very different to growing up in um, in Greenwich or Crystal Palace or Elephant and Castle like they're all different places London is not one place where are the stories that are specific to communities and not specific you're not you're just kind of generalistic um, I could talk for hours about this as you can probably imagine um, but I think being proud of where you come from in a very very specific way and wanting to have a cinema that represents your experience and the experience of your place is incredibly important and i hope that there are moves around the country to make it less london centric in terms of the types of projects that get made and as someone who now works and lives in cornwall i'm really really kind of proud to be part of a of a movement down here to represent place on screen which is not obvious and not you know ticking the boxes that everyone thinks are of a place well, Neil, thanks so much for all this time and doing this for free. Please join me in thanking uh, Neil for giving us this great talk. I'll see you soon. We'll do. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.